On the way to the service today, um, I was driving here with Jane and we were saying a couple of Hail Marys as you do on your way to the interfaith service. And um, I saw a bus go by with banners draped from it saying, no God, no worries. <laughs> and I thought, what a quintessentially marvellous uh, Australian moment, especially on the way to the interfaith service. And the bus had been hired for the day by the Sydney Atheists. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was going in the other direction. I would so have liked them to come and, uh, and join us because there isn't really much evidence that uh, no God actually means no worries. And maybe, unfortunately, there's also no absolute assurance that even if we invite into our hearts the possibility of knowing our divine source, that we will have no worries. I think, in fact, it's a little more complex than that, that we have to learn bit by bit and through the auspices of the greatest teacher of all, which is our own life how we have fewer worries, or how when we have worries, we approach them with greater trust, greater confidence, and even greater fruitfulness, so that they don't eat us up, but rather that we can meet life strengthened by our confidence in what lives within us. I'm wondering, and I've been wondering for several days as I've been thinking about this theme, whether many of you come to these services seeking peace. Is that what brings you here on a Sunday afternoon when you could be in so many different places? Is it peace most of all that you want? Or maybe you come wondering how you could sustain your peace Maybe you have glimpses of peace sometimes. Maybe even sitting here in the service, you feel peaceful. But how do you sustain it? This is also a challenge. It's a challenge to the intellect to think it through, as well as a challenge to the heart. But most of all, it's a challenge to the spirit. Because are we trying to meet the difficulties that are part of all of our lives through the intellect only? or through the personality self only? Or are we sometimes going to that place that Hazrat Anayat Khan invites us to consider on a daily basis the great ocean of being? I'm not sure that we can open to greater peace or open to a more sustained peace without knowing quite clearly and even rather coolly what routinely disrupts our peace. When our trust in ourselves, when our trust in one another, when our trust in the teachings of love, when our trust in love itself wobbles, and we feel completely alone, or we feel barren, or we feel disconnected, what is it that allows us to reconnect with that source within ourselves? That wonderful teaching, that paramount teaching that Jolyon read you, just those few words from 1 John 4.18. When love is complete, it casts out fear. And that's true. In those moments in which we come into an awareness of the love, the unconditional love, that sustains us, we need not be in the presence of our fears. We can bring our fears to that love and they can be softened. They can become manageable. They can become smaller than we are rather than bigger than we are. And that teaching from the Course in Miracles the only sacrifice that God asks of us is to give up fear. As long as we are afraid, we are not trusting in the, in the source, in the eternal, in the timelessness, in the divine. It asks a lot of us, doesn't it? 
it asks us that even in the presence of our own doubt, our self-doubt, our doubt in the other, and our doubt in God, that we can somehow set aside the fears <coughs> that cause us so much suffering. I've got two wonderful teachings to add to those you've already had. Both of them come from thousands of years ago, and they're as fresh as this morning. The first is from Deuteronomy, and it's, I want to say it's carved across my heart. I call upon heaven and earth to witness before you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Now how should we understand this? I think we understand it by recognizing that when we are afraid, we are withdrawing from the source of life. When we are willing to risk setting aside our fears, we are moving back into the flow of life even in the presence and especially in the presence of our own uncertainties. Choose life. And so often our fears come about because we don't know what to do next. And when we return to this teaching, we can hear, choose life. Choose what is healing. Choose what is wholesome. Choose what is nourishing. Choose what reconnects you to that deepest, and most profound and most reliable part of yourself and everyone else. Choose life. What a wonderful teaching. And at about the same time, another marvelous teaching was given, which we have come to know as the Four Noble Truths. The first of the Noble Truths is that in life there is suffering, and oh, those sufferings cause us so much fear. We know that. They cause us so much fear, including fear of our inadequacy, fear of our mortality, fear of our death, fear. The second of the Noble Truths is that there is a cause of suffering and that we can come to recognize that some of the suffering is of our own making and that we can look at it with compassion and we can soften it. We can recognize that we suffer when we hurt others. We suffer when we crave what does not feed the heart or the mind, or the spirit. We suffer when we are angry or we are the cause of anger. We suffer when we are the cause of violence. This is a profound teaching. Some of our suffering is completely unnecessary. And that takes us to the third of the Noble Truths, that there is an end to suffering. There is an end to suffering when we choose life. When we choose what is healing, when we choose what is good, when we choose what is perfect. And when we make that choice, of course, we attain what we most yearn for, most desire, most want, and most want to give which are the great gifts of happiness, compassion, and connection. And the fourth of the Noble Truths is, of course, that we achieve this by paying close attention to how we treat other people. This is the source of our peace, how we treat other people, not determined by how they are treating us, but determined only by our clarity that we have the possibility to treat others well. How? Why? Because we can draw on the strengths that we have had to do nothing to deserve. 
that we have only had to recognize the strengths of soul, the strengths of courage, the strengths of love that are our divine inheritance. One of the most beautiful things I think we achieve in our services here is to show that the source of this understanding comes across all time, from all cultures, in all the religions, that the source of our happiness, the source of our contentment, the source of our peace of mind is within and is expressed without in how we treat one another. We can never have peace of mind while we harm others. We can never grow in peace of mind without benefiting others. This teaches us the truth of our interbeing, our interdependence, our reliance upon one another. My peace can be disrupted by you. You have the power to support my peace. I have the power to support your peace, your nourishment, your upliftment, your growth in spirit and in love. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. I won't be with you. I will be in New Zealand teaching my Easter retreat at Mana. But it is the greatest feast in the Christian calendar. And why? Because we see in the example of the suffering and the excruciating death of Jesus how vivid suffering is in the human condition. And we see through the resurrection, which is celebrated next Sunday, that if we are to choose between life and death, that life will triumph. It is the story of the triumph of life over death, of love over darkness, of hope over fear. It is the most profound celebration and we can bring it close, whatever our tradition, we can bring it close to our own hearts so that in the face of our own suffering we can follow that ancient, marvellous teaching I call upon heaven and earth to witness before you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. What the teaching doesn't say but it implies is that you have the gift of consciousness, conscience and, cho and choice. How marvellous. You have the gift of choice. Choose life.